So the first step in the direction of finding uh, maxima and minima is known as Fermat's theorem. And it says that if f has a local max or a local min at c, and we know the derivative exists there, then the derivative has to be zero. Now this, if you sketch a graph, should seem intuitively clear. So we know that it has a, let's say, a local max. So it's going up, going up, going up, it turns around at C, and then it comes back down. So there's our local max. And if we look at what the tangent line should be, well, it should be horizontal. It should be a horizontal tangent line there. It had to go up, and it had to turn around to come back down in order for that to be a local max. So the tangent line has slope zero. In other words, the derivative at C should be zero. Now, if you think about this, okay, how, how can you turn around when you're climbing up? Again, we're thinking about coming along this curve. You're climbing up, you're climbing up, you're climbing up. You gotta hit this local max before you turn around. So you gotta turn around and come back down. How can you turn around and come down? Well, you can turn around smoothly, as we've shown here, or you can turn around by just doing a sharp corner there. The problem is if you do a sharp corner there, the derivative wouldn't exist. But in our statement of the theorem, we're assuming that the derivative exists. So if you come up, come up, come up, and you have to turn around to come back down again, and you know that where you turn around, your derivative has to exist, so you have to turn around in a smooth fashion, that means that you have to have a tangent line there, which has slope zero. That's what Fermat's theorem is telling us. It's telling us that if you turn around, you're either a local max or a local min, if you turn around on your graph, and you turn around at a place where the derivative exists, then you have to do it in such a way that the tangent line is horizontal. Or same with a minimum, the tangent line has to be horizontal there. Let's give a proof of this. Now I'm giving the proof just because we do have all the necessary tools to prove this. Unlike the extreme value theorem, I haven't proven that. And the reason I didn't prove the extreme value theorem was because it's actually quite a complicated theorem to prove. Um, it's typically done in a course, uh, Math 242, or real analysis, so a second year math course, dealing di directly in analysis, coming up and cleaning up all the loose ends of these theorems we didn't prove in calculus. This one, Fermat's theorem, we actually have the tools available to prove that theorem, so let's actually use them. So here I'm going to focus on the case where f has a local minimum at c. So we're looking at a diagram like this. So where the function comes down and then heads back up again. So there's our local minimum at c. So that's, that's the situation we're interested in. So what does this mean? Well, local minimum means that there is an open interval around c. I can find an open interval around c for which the function everywhere in that interval is bigger than or equal to the value at c. So this open interval, I'm just going to say, well, it's, it's got some radius, which I'll call epsilon. So I can find this open interval, and I can make it symmetric about c, and I'll just call the distance that the endpoints are from c epsilon. So um, let epsilon be some value bigger than 0 so that f at c is smaller than or equal to the function values at x for x in this interval around c, from c minus epsilon to c plus epsilon. So that's what we have. We have a local minimum there, so I can always find some small interval for which the value at c is the smallest for all values on that interval. Now what do I want to do? Well, I want to prove the derivative is zero. So we're going to have to go back and use the definition of derivative to show that f prime of c is zero. What I'm going to do is I'm going to move over just by h units to this new point, c plus h. And when I look at the function value at c and the function value at c plus h, I can draw the secant line through them. And what I'm interested in is looking at what the limiting value of the slope of the secant line is as h goes to zero. That would be the slope of the tangent, or in terms of the definition of derivative, that's the derivative of the function. 
So we're going to consider actually two cases. I'm going to consider what happens when h is to the right of c and what happens when h is to the left of c. So in case one, we're going to consider h c plus h to the, to the right of c. Sorry, I should say when h is positive or h is negative. When c plus h is to the right of c. So we're going to consider the case where h is positive but less than epsilon. That way c plus h doesn't break out of the interval that I know something about the function value of. So consider h between 0 and epsilon. Then c plus h, c plus h as I've drawn in my diagram here, is in the interval c minus epsilon to c plus epsilon. It's in that interval that I know something about the function values at. So I know then that f of c plus h has to be bigger than the value f of c. I know it's got to be bigger than it. I can even say bigger than or equal to zero because it may have may have bottomed out and gone horizontal for a bit before coming back up. And that still means that we have a local minimum at c. The function value is small as possible, but there are other points on the curve that have that same value, and that's fine. They just can't be strictly smaller than it. So f of c plus h is bigger than or equal to f of c. What does that mean? It means that f of c plus h minus f of c is bigger than or equal to zero. And you may be wondering at this stage, where are you going? What are you doing this for? Well, remember, the definition of derivative says I need to consider f of c plus h minus f of c divided by h, and then look at the limit as h goes to 0. So I'm just trying to get that numerator, some information about that numerator. So I've got that it's bigger than 0. So what does that mean? Well, now I can divide by h to both sides. And the key issue here is that h is positive. So when I divide both sides by h, I don't have to switch the inequality. I don't have to switch that inequality. h is positive, the inequality stays. Now I can take the limit. The limit as h goes to 0 of f of c plus h minus f of c all over h. That's got to be bigger than or equal to 0. But how do I know this limit exists? Well, this limit is the derivative. OK, so how do I know the derivative exists? Well, that's given in the question. f prime of c exists. So I know that this limit exists, and it has to be f prime of c. And so I know that f prime of c is bigger than 0. I know that f prime of c is bigger than 0. Now if I consider another case, namely when h is smaller than 0, but still bigger than negative epsilon. So I'm moving now to the left of c by h units. Then by an exact identical argument here, except with one uh, thing that changes, when I do all this stuff and then I divide by h, h is now negative. So when I divide by h, the inequality switch signs. And so I have that by a similar argument. f prime of c, well the inequality would have switched at this stage here. At this step here, that inequality would have switched to a less than sign. And that less than would have carried all the way down and would have given me that f prime of c is less than or equal to 0. So what I have is that f prime of c is both bigger than or equal to 0 and less than or equal to 0. And there's only one number that could be both bigger than or equal to 0 and less than or equal to 0. And that's 0. So therefore, f prime of c is exactly 0. And that's the statement that we wanted to prove. We wanted to prove that if you had a maximum, a local maximum, at a place where the derivative exists, then the derivative had to be 0 there. And we've proven that now. An, an identical argument will also work for the case where it's a local minimum. Again, remember we focused on, right at the beginning, we focused on, or sorry, we focused on the local minimum, but an identical argument can work in the case where it's a local maximum. So what we've got here from this theorem then is that if you know you have a local max or a local min at a place where the derivative exists, then the derivative has to be 0. So Fermat's theorem actually gives us some candidates for where to look for max and min. 
if I want to try to find a maximum or minimum of a function, it's telling me that I should probably look where the derivative is 0. But that won't capture them all. And we'll see that in a second. Still need a little bit more.